Anthurium and orchids to increase Hawaii's agriculture production. Well, thank you. I get to address you twice in this mor during this morning. Um, it's easy to talk about things that we like to do, so it's not a burden, but I hope it's not a burden for you to listen to me twice. Anyhow, um, I mentioned earlier that we had we have been really fortunate to have a lot of opportunities this past year. Another opportunity that came our way uh, was a Honolulu, I mean a Hawaii County grant to uh, work on orchid germplasm, and I will address that um, today. So when I prepared this slide, this was before the figures came out, and then Sharon says, hey, it came out. Well, I didn't have good wireless, so the best I can do was say that in 2016, we were up to 74.5 from 67 million. So that's the good news. So we have, among the commodities that experienced um, increase in value was anthuriums. So um, let me see. I had it here. Hello. Anyhow, so Anthurium said an increase in value. I can't remember exactly by how much. Oh, here, yeah, there we go. Um, so we do have research on Anthuriums. And the value of Anthurium production rose from, cut Anthurium, from $2.6 million to $2.7 million. Not too shabby for one year. And of course, to meet the demand and to be competitive, we have to be on our toes and develop new varieties. Uh, it takes about 14 years from pollination, so this endeavor is not for the faint-hearted or the impatient. So definitely 14 and a half years. So we hope to generate enough varieties before we retire. No, not soon. You can't retire. And uh, as we go through the process, uh, the green portion is what we undertake in Manoa. And then when the plants are ready to be tested, we go through five locations here in Hilo. And field test, in the beginning, we did release some materials that were premature, and we learned our lesson. Don't release prematurely. It takes time to go through a life cycle, and there are changes that even when we were going through seedling selection, we didn't notice some things. For instance, we had a variety that was released as Centennial. When we were undergoing advanced test for well, maybe six, seven years. We didn't see it turn obake. Nobody knew it was going to turn obake. And then once we heard, oh, they're turning obake, and we're like, what? We didn't see obake <laughs> during advanced test. And then it came out much later. So we learned our lesson we cannot release. We used to try and hurry up and push it out the production line. And we found out that pushing it too early has its drawbacks too. So what are the um, materials we are testing right now? We have, and this, the ones I'm showing first are the ones towards the tail end of their evaluation. So when we say evaluation, towards the tail end of the evaluation, my colleague here, Joanne, has run the vase life tests by then. And we do get feedback from the growers. The first one of the ones that are on the tail end and might likely, most likely will be released through another grant we received through the um, GIA is most likely UH 2010, which is uh, a salmon colored, which kind of fits in with what the designers like, that salmon peachy colored um, tone of uh, UH 2010. If you notice, what's really interesting, it's vase life that includes um, three days of packing is about almost 60 days. 58.3 days or 58.9 days does not matter much whether or not you use BA. That's... <laughs> they won't buy again. <laughs> so that's a little bit on the long side. We have another one, the na another one that we have is UH2200. It produces a lot of flowers, about 6.8 flowers per year. However, its vase life is not as long. So if you have your product mix, you can sell this with 2010 and you have enough inventory. This is an unusual one we have called UH2265. Grayson calls it Moi Moi because the stems like to recline. It's, it's a very restful stem. 
and for what we we are not quite sure why. We know that it grows very, it has a lot of foliage, so it may be related also to the density of the leaf foliage. But this is a very unusual color. Bordering on a little bit brown, we sometimes think of it as Neapolitan ice cream because you have that creamy vanilla color, that strawberry color, and some chocolate. So it's a very unusual color. Whether or not it will fly, it, it may not be your number one seller, but we feel that with the, at the rate the designers are working with us and showing their preferences, it seems like anything has a niche. It may not be the same quantities, but they have a use. It's kind of like offering them the candy store, where you have hard candy, soft candy, lollipops, and whatnot. So it's our goal to be the candy store for the designers. This is a nice red one called, um, which it looks very similar to New Pahoa Red or Lailani. It's UH2271. It has high yield, and with one cooperator, it didn't seem to be as susceptible to nematodes. However, it's leggy, but he's still happy with it, and so if they're happy, we're happy. Everybody's happy. So this is UH2271, and it's about seven flowers per year. That's not bad. This is an unusual pastel color. We haven't done as much work on this yet. Have you done the vase life? Oh, it's done. Okay, so Joanne has completed vase life on this one. Um, it's called UH1545, and it has that nice blushy orange. However, in Manoa, because it's been so hot where we have temperatures that are almost high 80s to almost 90s. This one does not look orange, but it's been bleaching out. Despite our shade cloth, it, it tends to bleach for us. Um, another drawback to this particular one is its weak root system. We've been losing it. It's not as strong for us. Or maybe that's we don't do as good a job of growing it out as some of our cooperators do. OK. This is an orange one that is um, a cross between Nita, which is the flat orange. If you have tropic mist, which is the, well, it's the fly, white fly water. I like to think of Nita as the orange fly water. So, but the conformation on this particular selection isn't as bad. It reclines nicely. Uh, its yield is fairly low, about five flowers per plant per year. But it's an interesting color, but we have to see if there's any more merit to it or whether or not it's a go or no go. But we noticed in one cooperator there were spots on it, and we thought it was something to do with the micronutrients in the particular fertilizer they were using. Um, this is one we thought we were excited about this before. This was the super we producer making about eight flowers per plant per year. It was a cross between tropic fire and tropical. Uh, nice gloss, but over time, and this is why you need to look at it over a longer period of time, this particular one occasionally develops blue spots that we're not sure why it's developing blue spots. Um, might be physiological. Tracy, <laughs> John. Could be calcium, but it still has blue. It helps. It helps, but we were seeing blue spots in this one, and it tends to be leggy. So we had plans to name this, but we will see what, what goes with this one. This was about eight flowers per plant per year, and that's on mature ones. We learned our lesson that we don't, <laughs> Grayson's laughing, we don't take data on young juvenile plants because it inflates our yield. So we learned our lesson, we'll grow it big, bigger, so that the yield, the intervals will be much more realistic as to yield. Because in the past, we used to take it as soon as they start flowering and start taking data, and we get high numbers, and that's not what happens. So we'd rather be conservative and take data on older plants. And then if we say it's eight flowers per plant per year, and on the grower's plots, they grow more than eight or even more, then we're happy. So n no more of taking uh, data too early. You had a question. <laughs> yes. What, what do you mean 
by Lady the plant? Lady meaning long internodes. So the plant grows really tall, fast. So this one, we tend to, we notice that the internode, uh, it's not a compact grower. Oh. So that's what I mean by that. So you have to pump, so yeah. get too tall to harvest in a more comfortable we, we have been topping it in maybe like three, four years in the greenhouse, but we don't grow it in beds, yeah. But this one, this one and 2271 tend to be, um, tend to have longer internodes. It's hard to see, but this is one of our interesting ones that's really dark red. And it doesn't seem to have as much uh, anthracnose as the other dark red I showed earlier this morning. This is UH2245. Another nice thing about this particular variety is that, not variety, it's still a selection, is that it's really easy to culture, put in tissue culture. We have some varieties that are very difficult to culture, somewhat stingy. So that one, when you have slow growing varieties in tissue culture, it is a bottleneck in the sense of getting materials, new materials out to the industry. So it takes a little bit more of an effort. For easy growing ones, it's easy to get your numbers fast. So we like this one because it's easy in tissue culture. We have some newer ones. This is UH2514, which is a complex cross. So it has Hokuloa, two doses of Acropolis, and Midori in its background. We know that when we have Midori in its background, it's beautiful, but there are some associated root problems and um, loss in plant vigor. So we know that. So this one, we're still looking at it. Uh, we know this one changes shape. So when it's small, it looks like a really um, typical heart shape standard. This is halfway through. And then when it gets really old, it gets really large and long. So you can look at it as a shape shifter. Uh, we don't know how long it will last in keeping, but we were told by some of the designers, large is good, but too large is not always good because you can't use it in bouquets. And since the weddings is one, weddings and events are two of the top um, top events, so you might be uh, considered as being the where the florists make a lot of um, their designs for. Therefore, it's their money maker is weddings and events. So too large flowers can be a drawback. We want large, but too much of a good thing is no good. This is an interesting variety we're looking at. It's called, um, it has Midori and Tropic Lime, which are two, a heart shape and a tulip type green um, anthurium in its background. It's complex. It also has a uh, tropical, which is a red Dutch variety. This is one of our fairly new uh, selections that have been transferred over. So it was just transferred as micro plantlets to the growers in April. And when we visited last June, it was starting to flower. So it would be interesting to see. And the nice thing about this one is the backside has a different um, color. It's more green, like bronzy. And for designers, they like to have that two different faces because then they can mix it with even more different colors. So it's interesting to see what the response to this particular variety will be. Okay, we are also looking at greens that may complement Midori because Midori is the number one green. This is UH2568. At first we thought that the pink streak right here might be problematic. We used to think that it has to be always a clean color. But we got schooled early on that a little bit of color makes it even in more interesting and it's useful for mixing too. Okay, so this, pa uh, this one was transferred over to cooperators in April of 2015. And then we didn't transfer as much on in 2016 but we made up for lost time by um, transferring uh, two white uh, varieties, uh, which both have Hokuloa and Acropolis in its background. This particular one on the right, UH2186, gets to be large and round. 
However, it is flexible. And so we hope it's a white that will not bruise because flexibility in the space is very important for packing. Okay, shifting over, so I was, we talked about the anthurium, so we're going alphabetical here. Anthuriums, then dendrobiums. I did not have time to update this, but uh, what's nice in the, to realize is that individual blossoms and potted in bloom for 2016 went down, but cut flowers went up. So that's promising, that's really good news that even though our potted plants are losing, are, had a decline in value, cut flowers uh, um, was going up in terms of value. And because cut flowers are going up in value, that means more pressure for us to produce seed pods. Um, when we work with Ogo, their main concern is UH-800, which is the preferred white. They like it, the growers like it, the florists like it, because UH-800 produces long stems, extremely long stems at that. So if there is a demand for that, then there should be a way to keep the parents that make these seed pods in a healthy condition, keep them healthy so that we can always guarantee good healthy seed pods. So about two years ago, Ogo, the orchid growers of Hawaii, um, was able to secure a county grant to have a germplasm for us to um, put our germplasm in tissue culture. And it was very timely because we know that climate change is happening. We know that the threat of hurricanes is real and that when we have hurricanes that uh, cause damage to our greenhouses, our plants get damaged, particularly our parent materials, and the recovery for these plants may take some time. So it's best to have a bank in the greenhouse, to have a germplasm collection in the greenhouse as well as in tissue culture. So that was the goal we had, was to put as much of our parent materials in tissue culture. Okay, with that task, we were able to put in the parents of UniY Mist. So this is um, D192. And this is important because this is a male sterile variety. So we always use it as a female. So for this one, oops, where's my, okay. Anyway, the one on top, I don't see it. Oh, there you go, this one. This one is a female fertile but male sterile, so we always need this if we want to have um, seed pods of um, dendrobium um, uniwai mist. The second one that we just got this, we, we, we don't even have it in multiplication. I think we just have about two flasks, but it has plantlets and was so difficult to clone but persistence pays off. So this is um, Neo Hawaii, which is the parent of Uni Y Pearl. We used to make a Nelly Sugi, but there hasn't been any demand for that. Who knows, we might have to resurrect it since it's another pink. Okay. Other parents that we have placed in culture include K44-50. It's a Jacqueline Thomas that makes Uni Y Supreme. I was at Watanabe Floral a couple weeks ago and they didn't have UniY Supreme. And they said they don't take pre-orders because they don't know about the, demand, uh, the supply. I'm thinking, okay, so there must be a real demand for UniY Supreme for some reason. Um, and so we thought, okay, it's good to have this parent in. Uh, also because UniY Supreme, I think is when you think of what the growers ask of our program to produce, I would say the three major or the three top requests are UH-800, UH-232, which is the purple one, um, la like lavender, and UH-1427, which is the purple one. Every year we get requests for that. And every year we, we still fail because either it's too hot, the seeds don't take, but we do try our best to fulfill the um, requests. Um, K159-21 is the parent of the two major whites, UniY Pearl and UniY Mist, but more importantly, UniY Mist. The, uh, 
its sibling is K159-26, which is, they're very similar. And it's the male parent of um, Uniwai Princess. And as Dr. Kamimoto found out, that he can use it also as a male parent. If we don't have 159-21, he can all, we did a test and it produced um, comparable. We can't tell the difference. So he said, okay, if our 159-21 is not doing too well and 159-26 is available, use it and we can make 800s out of that, which is really good. But just because we can substitute, we would prefer to use the original parents whenever possible. Okay, so this is UH-800. This is why it's the most widely grown white. It produces really long stems. Okay. This is what we were referring to as the tropical nouveau style. This is UH-800. Whoops. UH-800. And in, used in mixtures with roses and other temperates. So, um, it's really, you, you can see the length of the stem, so it's really a preferred one. And UH-800, this was at the AIFD um, ex, uh, bridal design sh um, presentation. It was really gratifying to see UH-800, oops, both as um, individual heads and also in sprays. So this was another um, design using 800. So it was really nice to see 800 embraced pretty much by um, high-end designers. Okay, so we talked about the whites. Now what about the purples? Since our, um, we also work with purples, we have also in placed in culture Dendrobium superbiens, Dendrobium Jacqueline in concert. This is important because this makes UH1081 Uni-Y Royale. Um, these two we haven't used a lot in breeding, but these are placed in culture because these are considered heirloom varieties. They're kind of old. They were made in the mid to early 60s, and so it's hard to find even these ones in the market. So one is Dendrobium Jacqueline Concert, and if I remember correctly, Dr. Kamimoto obtained this red from a grower in Maui. And then we obtained Dendrobium Norma Jackson Red Velvet. Norma Jackson's an old cross. From one grower, I think, in one of the orchid shows. And next year you go, you, you want to find it, you can't find it anymore. So whenever we find it in a show and we recognize the name as an heirloom variety, we'll just go and pick it up because next year you may not find it. Snooze, we lose. These are other varieties that we have uh, placed in culture. We have mostly, these are separate, but I couldn't locate my slides. I'm thinking there must be somewhere. My computer crashed one time and it might be in the um, disc that I have to resurrect. But anyway, we have the Joanna Messina. These are blue. Um, this is a Guntana blue with Toshiko blue for um, novel flower color. We've done a lot of crosses with Burana white that we are also evaluating right now. And the last one that we had, though not germplasm, it's more like something that we can re-release, is Dendrobium icy pink sakura. This one was a unique peach colored variety that was named and released. However, we couldn't get it to multiply in cult culture. In the past, we sent it over as um, propagules, and they just died. So we're hoping that changing the medium and tweaking it a little bit um, might help. And so we're looking into trying and see if we can re-release release this one. Okay. Other varieties that we have um, cons uh, put in tissue culture and um, for storage include parent materials of potted plants, um, Tendrobium phalaenopsis. We have two forms. And the hard part about dealing with species now is that you can't collect them legally from the point of origin without what we call um, paperwork, the passport. Um, they, the plants need passports too now, especially if they are collected from the country of origin. And that, I think Tracy will touch upon that too, because any time we deal with germplasm, passport information, particularly with species, is becoming more and more a requirement. And so these were sort of grandfathered in because these were collected in the late 70s, early 80s. 
We have other parent materials. This is um, one that Dr. Kamimoto made um, that was used for breeding Mari Marutani and Miyoko Azuma. And we made our own Dendrobium Caesar that was used to make Lim Chong Min and Lori Mortimer. Okay. These are our failures. You think everything is a success? No, we have our failures and no matter how hard we try, we'll just keep on trying until we get it to work. So we are trying to get the Superbian Superba. We have this, this one is really something we have to keep on trying to put in culture because this is the parent of Uniwai Supreme and Uniwai Prince. There's a couple of other varieties that we want to put in culture, but try, 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 and hopefully by next year, if we have another meeting next year, we can say, yes, we were successful. Okay, with that, I'd like to end with, we ended with even more challenges, but that's sort of the way of research. We always have opportunities and challenges. Any questions? Yes. Um, a few years ago, we, we toured your uh, facility, you know, facility, and we looked at the parent plants, particular parent plants. And I noticed, I don't know, it's always amazing to me that the parent plants are much shorter than what we grow up in the field. Um, Why? Yeah, you know, hey, is we that, think is it's more than the Is it the pump size? <laughs> Um, partly part pot size because we're only using one gallon. We don't move it up to a bigger pot size. And we know most of our plant materials out in the field, I mean out in the greenhouse, because they've been there from, I would say from the 1960s to 1970s. So you can expect with repeated sub, uh, subdividing that we probably, that tighter the virus on that one is pretty high. But when we do seed propagation, as long as we pick mature seeds and the seeds are not adhering to the maternal tissue, then we, we're not transmitting it. The other thing too is we're not feeding it luxuriously. <laughs> because if we fed it luxuriously, that would be too much work for us. So we try to give it, we, we, don't, we don't pump it with fertilizer. Yeah. Uh, yes, kind of. It, it helps with the management. That's what I like to think about it. So we just, if we, we try and have every two weeks foliar feed. I used to even put um, slow release, but when we were taking data, it was really hard. So we said, okay, we'll just go with every two weeks foliar feed, and that's about it. No, no extra TLC. All the bioresistant uh, Oh, your no. uh, we transferred it over to uh, to <laughs> to PBAR. I think all the lines, yeah, we we transferred four lines, five lines, so they have it. Yes, Johnny. What was the name of the UH eight hundred again? Uni Wine Mist. Uni Wine Mist. Thank you. Yes, sir. So, see, for for the members of Hefla that grow um, the Drobium orchid. Mm -hmm. um, are we planning to uh, get a little bit more into the breeding of, uh, of like reintroducing? I know this, uh, I haven't seen this for a while, so uh, reintroducing the old, old varieties to see if they want to grow more color. I think it would be, because we still have the parents, not for all. Some of the parents we have lost forever. Um, <laughs> But there are some that we might look into reintroducing because if there's interest, like for instance, that blush that we had, there was no interest. It's like it was there, nobody wanted it, and so we stopped producing it. But we kept the parent materials. So the, the key thing also with this germplasm project is that in the event that the growers want it again, we have the capability or the capacity to produce seed pods. So, yeah, we so can look into that. A lot of the advanced testing that went on with the dendrobium market, all I know is what the market tells me. And mm -hmm. so what they tell us is they like Hawaiian UH-800. They want that size. They want the way it spirals, mm -hmm. how it blooms, so it's full. They want that flowing feel, right? Mm -hmm. But if we, because we, we have the colors of the durium, yeah. if we had more color of dendrobium, it will 
complement yeah now so yeah. two two uh, generals or two yeah. type of plants can complement in this uh, right. your, your chop removal yeah concept. so but there are some inherent difficulties because of the germplasm unless I'm throwing out a hint to my colleague there might want him to look look into tweaking the pathway because oranges are very difficult like the orange of nita we don't see that in the cut flower dendrobium you can find it in some of the potted um, dendrobium species but it's not present that that bright orange of nita if we haven't i haven't seen it the orange that thailand produces is more like a soft type orange Real pastel. really pastel and we don't quite have the complement to that for um Anthuriums. So maybe we need Cynthia's products to transition. <laughs> That's how we work together, as to pr make the transition from one color to another. Because if you put the orchid and the, um, the dendrobium orchid and the anthurium side by side, sometimes the contrast is too stark. And that's why the designers are going through the intermediate soft colors of the other roses. Probably the hydrangeas can work in that too. So that might be something that we might be looking at. But that's definitely, um, um, we were trying to do some blue crosses. It's not really blue. We call it blue, but it's really purple. But it's a different purple, not a reddish purple, but a bluish purple, hoping that it will complement the Lavender Lady archetype. But we weren't able to get a good seed propagated variety for that. Because our goal used to be cross two parents if it's uniform, then we'll release it as a seed propagated variety. However, the philosophy is changing a little bit because our growers do use a lot of um, outsourcing for um, propagating via tissue culture. So maybe getting off types may not be necessarily bad. As long as we get healthy plant material, it performs well, then maybe we can go via tissue culture to have material that will complement the other tropicals. So that's another, um, you know, we always have to tweak and revise as we go along the way to address what the needs are. Jesse, I just had a question with the anthuriums. Are you doing any compact ones for um, potted? We're not doing really potted um, because the Dutch have focused so much on potted. Uh, the reasoning is that they're Focusing on potted because they don't see as much of their market going into cut arrangements. And with the smaller houses, smaller living places, the need for smaller plant materials is what the Dutch breeders are addressing. So they're doing a fantastic job with compact. In fact, they do compact with large flowers. And when we were at Howard's. Yes, so they, that was, um, those were Dutch varieties, yes. Plus, they grew, grew a good lot of them in uh, Florida. Yes. The, access to the markets makes it more difficult for us to be Right. Them. So between the Dutch and the Florida breeders, uh, Twyford does a whole lot of that. Um, they probably have, they, they do that really well, so we'll do our work really well. Yes. <laughs> we'll do our niche. <laughs> we'll, be a, we'll be the biggest fish in our smaller pond. <laughs> Any other questions? Okay, great, thank you.